Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Power brew this morning. Uh, we're going to get a chance to hear from uh, Dr. Brooke Bussard in just a few minutes about um, healthy eating habits, uh, nutrition in the workplace, and how we can better improve our personal and professional lives. So my name is Michelle Shepard. I am the Client Support Services Coordinator with Advantage C, a service of Carroll Community College. And just a few um, items here about Advantage C. So we provide individuals, teams, and organizations the training, tools, and support needed to influence critical business outcomes. So some of the things we do, you can see on your screen here, are custom training. We do a lot of leadership and management training, sales and service. We have professional coaching, leadership, team, and performance coaching. We do business consulting, uh, facilitation. We can help with strategic planning, focus groups, technology planning, and then we have our research-backed assessments, and we have a new complete suite of DISC products, so DISC Workplace Management 360 Conflict and Sales Instruments. We also want to talk a little bit about our management development training workforce certificate. So whether you're a current manager, you're new to leadership, or you would just want to develop your management skills, um, you can complete this entire certificate in just under five months. So the, um, the courses started in the beginning of September and they end um, about December. And then we have a new cohort starting in February. So if you have any questions on that, feel free to give us a call. You can email us as well. There is a uh, website on the screen there, carolcc.edu backslash CE certificates. So are you hungry for nutrition knowledge in the workplace? So just a little bit about Dr. Bussard. So she started her career as a resident in internal medicine after graduating from the University of Virginia School of Medicine. She realized that prevention or reversal of disease rather than treatment was really a better fit for her personality. She has become a personal trainer and nutrition specialist with the American Council on Exercise and then allied with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine as a Food for Life instructor. She's a health coach that helps people achieve optimal wellness using nutrition to prevent reverse of disease. So she really teaches people that fruits, vegetables, grains, and legumes, saying that right? You are. <laughs> Fosters increase energy and vitality, weight maintenance, clear skin, which I think we could all use, better digestion, and so much more without calorie counting and restriction. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Brooke and can't wait to hear what she's got in store for us. Well, thanks so much for having me back, uh, Michelle. I was excited to get your invitation to do the webinar this month. Um, September is like the other January. Labor Day is sort of the New Year's of the workplace. So I thought we could really use this information today to launch into a healthier lifestyle right away, uh, both in the workplace and at home. So the first question that we need to ask ourselves is what is nutrition? Because I'd like to clarify that right from the beginning. Nutrition is the process of providing or obtaining the food necessary for health. And when we talk about health, we need to talk about both physical health and mental health. And, and what we eat is so important um, for both of those things. And so we will focus today um, on those particular foods. So I like to think of foods in two categories. The food that's necessary for health, we can define food as either it promotes health or it hinders health. I think when we talk about food and label it as good or bad, we get into a lot of sticky areas with guilt, rebellion. Um, so if we can categorize our, our food as either health promoting or health hindering, then it really clears things up. So if I were to show you this slide filled with a bunch of different kinds of foods and asked you which of these foods promote health and which hinder health, I bet you would get pretty much all of them correct. So if we think about foods that promote health, we're gonna pick out fruits and vegetables, right? And if we think about foods that hinder health, we're gonna pick out soda and candy and chips and processed meats. 
So here's a picture of our health promoting foods. The broccoli, the apple, asparagus, blueberries, and avocado. It's pretty simple, right? All of a sudden it's not very confusing anymore. And if we want to pick out the health hindering foods, we're going to pick out the sodas, the chips, the Cheetos, the bacon. So we have two big questions. Why does it matter? Why does it matter what we eat? And then our next question is, how can I do this? But we have to have the why in order to make the how stick. The why is critical. So what happens when we eat poorly or skip meals? Well, I would say the number one symptom that people get is a low energy level. They feel fatigued, they feel like they're dragging, um, they just don't have enough energy um, to do what they wanna do. Another thing that happens is decreased mental clarity. This sort of fog that you get in your head, this fuzzy brain feeling. You're just not as sharp as you would be if you had eaten well. There's also decreased creativity. You have trouble thinking of new ideas and, and being creative. And all of that leads to decreased productivity. And in addition to, uh, to all of those things, we know that when, when people eat poorly, they have increased levels of anxiety and depression. So the mental health aspect uh, really comes into play here. So would we let kids just eat a bowl of chips and go to school in the morning? Or have that for their afternoon snack before they start doing their homework? Not in an ideal world, we certainly wouldn't. So I'm gonna show you three studies uh, to sort of drive home that why, why does it matter what we eat? And particularly these will help uh, with workplace productivity as well. So the first one uh, was done in New Zealand, published about five years ago called On Carrots and Curiosity. Eating fruits and vegetables is associated with greater flourishing in daily life. They saw that um, from prior literature, eating fruits and vegetables was associated with happiness and life satisfaction. And so they wanted to look a little bit further and dive into actual behaviors like curiosity and creativity. And sure enough, they saw in their research that both curiosity and creativity were increased with increased fruit and vegetable intake. The next one I wanna show you uh, was published just earlier this year in the UK, and I love this title, Let Us Be Happy, a longitudinal UK study on the relationship between fruit and vegetable consumption and well-being. And in this study, the researchers looked at anxiety and depression, markers of mental health, and they found that both improved with fruit and vegetable intake. And the last study I'm gonna show you was done here in the US, Back in 2014, it was published, and it's the association between health behaviors and employee productivity. Now, these health behaviors, these optimal lifestyle-related health behaviors that they looked at were sleep, physical activity, tobacco use, fruit and vegetable intake, and alcohol consumption. They separated sleep from the others, and and the other four were, were lumped into this category um, called the optimal lifestyle metric. And they found that with increased phys physical activity, increased fruit and vegetable intake, low tobacco use and low alcohol consumption, that workers had significantly less productivity loss. And they also found that um, with an adequate amount of sleep between seven and eight hours per night, um, they had less productivity loss. So actually, too little sleep and also too much sleep um, increased uh, the productivity loss. But we're gonna focus on the food, um, and we're gonna hope that after hearing all of this, that your workplace becomes a healthier, happier place that's more creative, more curious, more energized, and more productive. And while we're speaking of all these things, I want you to be thinking about um, translating this into your family life, taking this home to your, 
to your family, to your parents, to your kids, to everyone um, who surrounds you. Because a healthy lifestyle shouldn't just happen in certain parts of our lives. It needs to be fluid. It needs to happen everywhere, all the time. It needs to be a part of your mindset. So that leads us to the next question. How, how are we gonna do this? So let's assume you wanna be healthier and you know food is part of the equation, but you're confused and overwhelmed by the amount of information that surrounds us about what we should be eating. If you get your nutrition information from newsstands and product marketing, it's no wonder you're confused. We hear about all these different diets like keto, paleo, we hear about intermittent fasting. We look at product labels, um, like on this sausage here that says no nitrate added, and we assume that makes it safe. There's all sorts of information out there that confuses us, and we really need to try to clarify it. The good news is, is that the answer is pretty simple, and I think you'll see after just a few more slides that what we're talking about is food that we need to fuel our body every day. Food should not be complicated. It's a critical part of our life and it shouldn't be the most confusing part of every day. So I like to look at populations, cultures who um, have very healthy lifestyles. I don't think it's helpful to look at cultures who lived many, many years ago, and whose average life expectancy was between the ages of 30 and 35. People who faced a very different set of circumstances than we face today. These people didn't even have antibiotics. These people who, um, you know, wore loincloths and hunted with spears. And a lot of diets focus around, you know, populations who lived long ago. But instead, I think we should look at populations who are currently alive in 2019, who are thriving and active into their 90s and even into their early 100s. Does anybody know which populations I'm talking about? If you've heard me in any prior webinars, you know that I like to talk about the Blue Zones. The Blue Zones uh, were identified by Dan Buettner, a National Geographic Explorer, about 15 years ago, and he has followed these populations over the past decade. These are five areas of the world where people live the longest, healthiest lives. They are not going into nursing homes in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. They don't have chronic diseases like heart disease, diabetes, um, cancer, autoimmune diseases. These are people that are active, thriving members of their community into their 90s and beyond. And these five areas of the world are um, Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, uh, the, somewhere in Costa Rica, Nicoya, Costa Rica. Here in the US, it's Loma Linda, California, and Ikaria, Greece is the fifth blue zone. So in these blue zones, they have several things in common. They maintain an active lifestyle. They have physical activity in their day. And, and by that, I don't mean they go to a CrossFit class in the morning and then sit at their desk for eight to 10 hours afterwards. They have activity built into their day. They move around. They also have what they call the right tribe. They have social support, um, which is very important. They have a positive outlook on life and they eat wisely. And that's the thing that we wanna focus on is what do they eat? So if we look at what they eat in the blue zones, we can see that 95% of their diet is centered around plants. It's plant-based and 5% of their diet comes from animal products. Now this chart uh, that's on the blue zones website breaks their food down into carbs, fats, and proteins. And I really don't like to look at food as individual macronutrients because all whole plant foods have carbs, fats, and proteins in them. Um, animal foods typically have proteins and fats. So it's, it's hard to 
to look at this chart easily. But I think the bottom line is that 95% of the food in the blue zones is plant-based. And we need to compare that to the American diet and see what the difference is. But first, let's look a little closer at Loma Linda, California, which is a blue zone here in the United States, and see what they're eating. So in, in Loma Linda, 32% of their diet is from vegetables and 27% is from fruits. Then they have 10% of their diet from dairy, 12% from legumes and soy. And legumes are anything that grow in a pod. So beans, peas, lentils, all of those are legumes. 7% comes from whole grains. And then we have 4% from meat and poultry and 1% from fish. So you can see that the animal products are around 5% although in Loma Linda they do consume 10% of their diet from dairy. If we compare that to the standard American diet, 51% of the standard American diet comes from processed foods. That is a huge number. So that would be, you know, all of those things that you see in vending machines, chips, candies, um, cakes, donuts, and then all those processed foods that you see packaged in the frozen food aisle, um, and we'll get more into processed food here in a minute, but 42% of, of the diet comes from animal products. That's a huge difference from 5% that we see in the Blue Zones and even in Loma Linda, California. So and the, those animal products include not only sausage and bacon and all the processed meats, but it also includes um, beef and chicken and fish. And only 7% of the American diet comes from fruits and vegetables, 7%. So we know that in Loma Linda, I think our numbers added up to around 60% of the diet came from fruits and vegetables. And so the standard American diet is very far from that. So we need to figure out how to get across this bridge. We need to get away from the standard American diet and move over to the land of whole, unprocessed plant foods. This is where health-promoting foods are in these whole plant, unprocessed foods. We need to get the large amount of animal foods out of our diet and try to get our diet closer to the blue zones. So how are we gonna do that? How are we gonna go from one to the other? Well, we need to add foods in and take foods out. So we need to add in things like oatmeal with berries, bowls of vegetables, and we need to take out processed meats like sausage, and we need to take out things like chips and candy and crackers. So we've got some addition and subtraction to do. And when we do that, when we add in a bowl of um, oatmeal with berries, we're adding in for the, for the whole oats, we're adding in fiber and a lot of nutrients that come from oats. From the berries, we're adding antioxidants that protect our cells from damage. When we add the bowl of vegetables filled with many different colors, remember, eat the rainbow, we're getting all those phytonutrients, nutrients that come from plant material that provide vitamins and minerals to our cell. Those are health-promoting foods. And we want to subtract out processed meats like the bacon, which is a level one carcinogen. And um, if you haven't heard, in 2015, the World Health Organization uh, put out a statement saying that processed meats were now in the level one category of cancer-causing agents. So we've got to get bacon, sausage, hot dogs, all those processed meats, regardless of whether or not they have nitrates or not. We need to take those out of our diet. They increase our rate of colon cancer along with other kinds of cancer. We also want to subtract out processed foods that cause inflammation and they flood our body with additives and preservatives. So we want to take those foods out. Remember, eating is a zero-sum game. Now these are the words of Michael Greger and I highly recommend his book, How Not to Die, which I brought a copy today. I don't know if you can see this or not. How Not to Die. Um, it's even got recipes in the back and tons of literature. So Michael Greger has a website, nutritionfacts.org. They have a lot of great uh, videos. A lot of research um, is on that site. 
But he says, remember, eating is a zero sum game. When you decide to eat one food, it means you're choosing not to eat another food. After all, there's only so much food you can consume in one day. So whatever you choose to eat has an opportunity cost. So it's a zero sum game. We need to take out foods that are health hindering and we need to add in foods that are health promoting. And in the words of Michael Pollan, many of you have probably heard this before, he says, eat food, not too much, and mostly plants. And that aligns very well with the blue zones, right? So I don't think we need any more knowledge. I really don't. I think we know what to do now. I think we really know what to eat. What we need is an action plan. We need to know how to get those health promoting foods into our diet and how to take out those health hindering foods. So the American Heart Association has put together a toolkit to make it easier to create a healthy workplace. I thought this might be very helpful uh, for you to use as a resource um, to implement a healthier eating environment. This is the Healthy Workplace Food and Beverage Toolkit. And why do we want to do that? We want to we want to implement a healthy workplace in order to make everyone more energized, more creative, more curious, and more productive, right? And that will lead to healthier, happier employees. So that healthy workplace food and beverage toolkit starts with some recommendations. Their first recommendation is to support healthier choices, provide leadership and role modeling, and create a culture of health. So we hear all the time about creating, you know, a great culture at the workplace, but let's really focus in and make it a culture of health. And we're going to do that by offering nutritious food and beverage options. Now the toolkit goes on to make other recommendations about physical activity and getting rid of tobacco and, and other things like that. We're just going to focus on the nutritious food and beverage options today. And so to create a culture of healthy eating, we need to start by leading by example. So when organization leaders support and model healthy eating, it makes a very powerful statement. So one thing you can do is sign a pledge or a commitment and post it in a common area where both employees and visitors can see it. And in the toolkit, they even give you a sample pledge. So here's an example for a healthy workplace food and beverage pledge. So you would fill it out and you would say, Advantage C values the health of our employees and guests. And we want to create a culture of health and we will commit that our workplace will make healthy changes to vending machines, cafeterias, meetings and events. We'll provide leadership support and model the healthy food and beverage efforts. It's so important to model this behavior instead of just talking about it. Actions speak so much louder than words. We need to provide more fruits and vegetables. We want to reduce and ultimately eliminate sugar-sweetened beverages. And we want to reduce and ultimately eliminate candy and other less nutritious high-sugar foods. So the next thing we can do is communicate to the employees that we care. We care about their health and well-being. And we're going to provide education and resources um, to help them on this path. So here's a sample email to employees, and this is included in the toolkit as well. So this could be to all staff from, let's make this from Michelle <laughs> at Advantage D, right? And she's saying, this is our commitment to a healthy workplace. So we value the health of each of our employees, and we want to provide an environment in which you can thrive. Now, I'm not going to read this whole sample email. Um, you can find it on the toolkit. But the important points are that the healthy choices should be the easiest choices. And our aim is not to take away personal liberties, but to create a healthier work environment that will benefit all of us. So we're not going to have the vending machine just there tempting people. 
we want to we want to make better choices um, that are easier for people to make. Now we'll talk more about the vending machines in a minute, but let's think again about how we can translate this into our family life and how we can bring this whole healthy lifestyle home with us and keep it fluid from place to place. If we go home and we open our pantry and we see something that looks similar to a vending machine, that's not going to help us move toward a healthier lifestyle, right? So we want to make sure that anything we do at home and at work complement each other. We don't want to have this um, vending machine-like pantry when we go home from work and we're tired and it's really easy to make poor choices. So we could now make a sample email to family members. I'm not kidding. We could make a sample email to family members, to all family members, again, from Michelle. She's making this to her family and say, this is our commitment to a healthier home and say, I value the health of each of, of each of you, each of our family members, and we want to provide an environment in which everyone can thrive. We want the healthy choices to be the easy choices. We don't want to take any way anybody's personal liberties, but we want to create a healthier home that will benefit us all. We want to reduce our chances of getting chronic diseases like heart disease, diabetes, autoimmune diseases, and cancer, and we can do that by getting rid of health hindering foods in our home and making more um, health promoting choices available to everyone at all times. Okay, so let's go back to office food for a minute. Office food is food in the workplace that is often provided at no cost to employees. It's available in common areas on a help yourself basis. It's purchased or made by employees. So, Probably the most common thing I see in workplaces are donuts, and they're usually brought at breakfast time. Well, fruit is a great thing to eat at breakfast time. So why not bring a bunch of bananas? I brought a bunch of bananas here with me today just to show you guys how simple it is. If I just carried that into an office and handed one to everyone, that is a thousand times better than handing out donuts. And cheaper. And cheaper, honestly. I think this bunch of bananas was $1.47. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so much healthier. So making just simple swaps like that can go a very long way. And again, it's setting that example, providing leadership, um, and setting you know, good, good role modeling for everyone. So here are some recommendations to help manage food challenges. From And this comes from the toolkit. When food is made available in a common area and employees are allowed to help themselves, limit the amount of time the food is available. So say somebody brought in the donuts, they didn't bring in the bananas, but they're going to next time, but they accidentally this time brought in the, the donuts. Make sure that the donuts don't sit out for the next three hours so that people can walk by and get a second donut and a third donut and maybe a fourth donut and then put some in a bag and take them home with them and eat them after work. Make them available during the meeting and after the meeting. If there's donuts left over, honestly, put them in the trash can. That's where they belong. They don't belong in the human body. The body is not a trash can, so don't, don't eat them just because they're there. So other ways that we can celebrate um, special occasions um, by providing uh, better food. So birthdays are a common time when people bring in processed foods that are high in sugar and fat. How about instead, you could bring in another kind of food, a health promoting food, like a basket of fruit, or you could pick a different activity. So you could say, let's go for a walk at two o'clock today. We're going to do a birthday walk for Michelle, and we're going to walk two laps around, you know, the outer part of the college campus. Um, it's a beautiful day out and we'll get some fresh air and that's how we'll celebrate the birthday. So the birthday doesn't have to be celebrated with food. You can think of other ways to, to celebrate it. You could you know, have everybody pitch in and get flowers for someone for their, to put on their desk for the day. Okay, so 
hopefully you guys are inspired at this point to um, start the new year now. Let's go ahead and use Labor Day in September as an impetus for jumping into a, a healthier lifestyle, a healthier workplace, and a healthier, um, a healthier home. So how in the world are we going to do this? You're thinking, this sounds great, but my schedule is crazy. How am I going to implement this? The first thing we need to do is prioritize. We have got to prioritize healthy eating and healthy living. I guarantee you that, um, you know, if there's a new movie coming out and your schedule is crazy, you will find three hours to leave your house, drive to the movie theater, get a seat, sit and wait for the movie to start, watch the movie, drive home, and then you'll be so glad you did it, right? But you spent three hours doing it. You prioritized that movie. Or I heard, did I hear the new um, iPhone 11 came out? I know a lot of people who are extremely busy. They'll never tell me, oh, I have so much free time. I'm going to go over to the Apple store and wait in line <laughs> and get the new iPhone. They prioritize these things. Whether or not they think of it as a prioritizing situation, that's exactly what they did. They prioritized it. So we need to prioritize healthy eating. And I'm going to show you how to do that. And it's not going to be very hard. So we're going to prioritize, and then we're going to plan. And we're going to remember, don't forget this, that change is always hardest in the beginning. It always takes the most time in the beginning and it will get easier. It will get less challenging. And in this process, you will create new habits that will replace old ones. And the amazing thing is that you'll feel better. You will feel so much better. And these new habits, they'll make you healthier, they'll make you happier, and you'll want to repeat them. But you have to prioritize, you have to plan and stick with it and make it through the first several weeks um, until it becomes more uh, of your routine. So what does a day of healthy eating look like? Let's go through and just visualize it first. Let's visualize. So breakfast in the morning. Like I said, we want to take out those processed meats. We want to take out sausage and bacon. Uh, we don't want to swing through the drive-in at any fast food places and get some sort of bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich. We want to have whole plant foods. The easiest whole plant foods to have in the morning are, I think, oatmeal. Oatmeal is so simple. You can have rolled oats. You can have steel-cut oats. You can have quick oats. You just take an oat. It is a whole grain, and you add water or a plant-based milk and you microwave it for two minutes. You can add frozen berries. This morning I had rolled oats. I threw in um, frozen blueberries, put it in a microwave for two minutes, and it was delicious. Um, you can add some chopped walnuts on top. You can add apples and raisins if you prefer that to blueberries. Um, there's so many different ways to make your oats. And people think oatmeal is so boring. It's actually not. There's so many different ways to to spice up your oatmeal. You can go online. How many times have you Googled anything else throughout the day? Just Google ways to eat oatmeal, different recipes for oatmeal. Um, but if you're really not an oatmeal person, um, you can make a smoothie. There's so many different smoothie recipes you can make. Um, breakfast cookies are another idea. In the picture on the slide on the left, you'll see some breakfast cookies. Those are a staple in my household. My younger son eats two breakfast cookies every morning uh, before school. And I will tell you that that recipe, I have shared that recipe with so many people, um, and we can share it with you all. Michelle can send an email and share it with you. That recipe is a favorite um, for so many people because it's simple. You can make, I mean, I quadruple the batch. I make 48 cookies at once, and they last in the freezer for a couple of months. They're so easy to make and very transportable. And the base is bananas, almond butter, maple syrup, oats, flaxseed, raisins, and chocolate chips. It doesn't get any more fun than that. Um, and another thing we can talk about making are overnight oats, because that's something that you can make ahead. You can make a whole batch on Sunday for the entire week, and you can just pull them out of the, out of the fridge. You can add some fresh berries to the top if you want. Uh, but that is a great breakfast and very easy 
and very transportable if you want to bring it to work and eat it at your desk too. So here's a recipe for overnight oats. This one's my favorite, the chocolate peanut butter overnight oats. And I've actually transitioned from peanut butter to almond butter. Just I just like the taste a little bit better. But this is oats, almond or coconut milk, um, cocoa powder, peanut butter or almond butter, or if you've got a nut allergy, you can use sunflower seed butter or there's soy nut butter nowadays. Then we add in chia seeds and maple syrup. Very simple. And this picture shows you three other kinds of overnight oats as well. I have a client who recently, she made eight different kinds of overnight oats one weekend and sent me a picture. She is so creative. So anyway, just to tell you, there are a hundred different ways to make overnight oats. You can just Google and see what appeals to you, what appeals to your taste. When I've made those overnight oats, uh -huh. it's amazing how the chia seeds just swell up. And they're yes. so good. They're so good, aren't they? They really are. They really are. So um, the other option I was telling you is just to make a smoothie. And this is a spinach banana mango smoothie recipe that I thought I'd share with you um, that you can make and take on the go. So if you're someone who really needs to rush out the door in the morning and, and drink a smoothie in your car, by all means do it. But have whole plant foods as the base of your smoothie and you're right in line with the blue zones and those health promoting foods which are going to make you healthier, happier, more creative, more curious, more energized, all those things that we want to be every day on our way to work. Okay, so to continue our day of healthy eating at lunch, we could have a burrito. So just take a tortilla, fill it with black beans and corn, some lettuce, some pepper, some onions, and some salsa. You can throw some guacamole on top or put some avocado in there. And then your snack could be a honey crisp apple. And in the evening, when you go home, you could have whole wheat pasta with white beans, pasta e fagioli is what it's called. And then add some olives and spinach and marinara sauce. So again, we're eating whole plant foods, and um, it's really not that challenging once you start to realize that these are sort of things that you already eat. You just need to make sure that you keep them clean and eat them more consistently. Brooke, is there a serving size you recommend for this? Because I'm just looking at those pasta, oatmeal, uh, the burrito, uh, lots of carbs. carbs. Can you suggest? Can you suggest a serving, serving size, size eating, I don't, I don't know. Sure. So a serving size typically for oatmeal would be a half a cup of oats, um, and then you throw in a half a cup of your liquid, whether it's water or almond milk. And then, you know, the blueberries, the apples, those are not calorically dense at all. So you can really just eat as much of that as you want. Um, and then for nuts and seeds, if you're going to add any nuts to the top, typically just, you know, I would say, a tablespoon of chopped nuts, maybe a little bit more. But I tell people, particularly if you're trying to watch weight or lose weight, um, you know, steer away from the nuts and seeds and stick to, you know, the portion size of your grain, which is a great source of energy, but then really fill up on the fruits and vegetables because those are not calorically dense. Then at lunchtime, when you're filling your tortilla, so there's a couple things here. So if you're someone who can maintain your pr weight pretty easily, then, you know, have a tortilla or two and fill it with, with the corn and the beans um, and the lettuce, tomatoes, salsa. If you're someone who's trying to lose weight, you can take the tortilla out of the equation altogether and go with corn and beans and put this in a Tupperware container that you'll bring to work corn and beans, and then a lot of peppers and onions, a lot of those vegetables with, with some um, lettuce on the top and your salsa. And don't put the lettuce on the bottom, put the lettuce on the top of the Tupperware. And when you get to work, then mix it all together. But that way your lettuce doesn't get soggy. Yeah. But so when I think of our whole plant foods that we want to be the staple of our diet, I think of fruits, vegetables, grains, and legumes. Fruits and vegetables are not calorically dense. I think fruits and vegetables have anywhere from, you know, 200 to 600 
calories per pound of food. When you look at grains, you get a little bit higher, 600 to 800 calories per pound. And I might be off a little bit on my numbers. Um, I should have made a slide for that. I have those in another presentation. And then your legumes are around the same. It's when you get to things like um, um, cheese, uh, some of the dairy products, some of the animal products, and then the processed foods. That's where you get into um, over a thousand calories per pound of food. And that's why eating plant foods helps people lose weight is because they're so much less calorically dense. And that includes whole foods like brown rice, whole wheat pasta. Those things are not nearly as calorically dense as processed foods, a lot of dairy products, and animal-based um, meat products. Yeah. So, um, so when you think of that tortilla, the, the corn is your grain. So corn is a grain. If you think about how it's grown out in a field, people often think of corn as a vegetable. So I say, if, you, if you're going to eat a lot of corn, don't have a lot of tortilla with it. If you're somebody who's trying to lose weight and you need less density. And then the beans are your legume. And then your fruit and vegetables are going to be your peppers, onions, and salsa. Tomatoes are technically a fruit, so <laughs> you don't have to worry about throwing another fruit in, into your tortilla. Yeah. And then as far as portion size of pasta, mm -hmm. so again with pasta, I would say, you know, a small amount. And really, if you're trying to, if you're someone who has trouble maintaining weight or, or you're trying to lose weight, I would add more vegetables in and cut back on the pasta until you see what works for you. So for a lot of people, one cup of pasta and then the rest of the vegetables, the spinach particularly, add a lot more spinach. Um, a little bit of olives. Olives do have a high fat content, so um, you could even leave out the olives and substitute in onions and peppers or zucchini and squash. Make a great um, addition to a pasta dish. Um, fresh tomatoes cherry tomatoes, things like that, to your pasta dish. Um, eggplant makes a great addition. Yeah, so many different vegetables that you can add and really change your pasta dish. But always try to add in that legume, those white beans, and just a half a cup of white beans with some pasta and some veggies makes a totally well-rounded, nutritious dinner. Because then we have all four things from, from our food groups that we need. Okay. So what we really want to do is prioritize. We need to get our mind right and decide we want to do this. And remember that it's not impossible. It might be extremely difficult. I don't know what your starting point is. But that difficulty gets easier. Like it's really hard at first, but it gets easier. And if we take small steps and progress in the direction we want to go, eventually we'll get there. I love this quote, don't fear, don't fear failure, fear being in the exact same place next year that you are today. So just keep working in the direction that you want to go. So that might start with breakfast. You might say, I'm gonna change my breakfast tomorrow and I'm gonna work on breakfast until it's a well-oiled machine. It might take a week, it might take a month. But I'm going to wait till breakfast is easy and down pat, and then I'm going to move on to lunch. And then I'm going to move on to dinner. It doesn't have to happen overnight, but you have to get your mind right, decide I'm going to do this, I'm going to work in this direction, and with each step, you'll feel better, you'll get healthier, you'll feel happier, you'll be more creative. All those things will start to fall into place, and you'll be more excited about taking the next step. So planning. This is, where, this is where it's all going to happen. We need to get our ducks in a row. So I thought I'd show you this cute little picture of my boys. Um, we were out on a lake, and this, this amazing family of ducks swam by. And you have to look closely to see on the right side of the um, paddleboard, there's a mother duck swimming with, I can't remember how many little baby ducks behind her, but they were adorable. Um, so we've got to get our ducks in a row. And we're going to start by creating a weekly menu. And then we're going to create a grocery list. And then we're going to shop. 
we're going to prep, and we're going to eat. And all this is going to get easier and easier. So we're going to start by creating the weekly menu. And in order to do that, all we need to do is sit down and write out what we're going to eat. Now, this one's kind of hard to see. This one I scribbled on a piece of paper in my car. It was getting dark, and I was waiting for my son at football practice. But it, And I didn't have any cookbooks with me. So a lot of times in my car, I keep cookbooks, and I'll pick out recipes. But this particular day, I said, you know what, I'm just going to jot down a bunch of stuff that I know might already be in the house. It's kind of a crazy week. So Monday, veggies, pasta, and marinara is what I wrote down, right? And then Tuesday, tacos. Does that say tacos on there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, usually I do tonight will be Taco Tuesday, just because that's easy to remember. And my younger son loves Tuesdays because he knows he's coming home and there's tacos with corn and beans and you know, uh, peppers and onions and salsa. And then Wednesday, uh, stir fry. So you can add all sorts of veggies to a stir fry. So what did I add on there? I added um, edamame and carrots and bok choy and water chestnuts. Uh, Thursday, flatbread with peppers and mushrooms um, with marinara sauce. So we just make a pizza essentially with no cheese. And it's delicious. And once you do it a couple of times, you're like, oh, yeah, I didn't really even need that cheese anymore. Um, just trying to get rid of those animal products that we know are health hindering. Then Friday, red beans and rice. That is so simple. Red beans and rice. And then you can throw in um, some onions and peppers if you want. But super simple. Um, and then for breakfast, you could have oatmeal every day. You could do smoothies every day. And then lunch, you can take leftovers to work. You can make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Um, the next slide, oh, this is where I was sitting down and I had a bunch of cookbooks out. So then I went through and I wrote down, okay, Monday I'm going to have, I, I don't remember what I was going to have, but I'll put down the page number of the cookbooks. So I brought um, one of my cookbooks here, the power plate. So, um, I've got little tabs in there of what I'm going to make when. And so for that week, I just refer to the cookbook and the page number and, you know, I'm all set. So there's so many great cookbooks at the library. And usually I always start there before I buy a cookbook. I go to the library. I check out five or six, keep them in the trunk of my car. And then when I'm waiting for to pick up a child or waiting at a doctor's office, just get out the cookbook and say, okay, these are the recipes that I want to try. Um, and that's how you create your menu. So is that pretty simple, creating the menu? I think so. Okay, good. Okay, so we're going to create the menu. And then the next thing we do is we have to create a grocery list. So we just take our menu now. We've got our menu. And we write down what ingredients we need for each day. So I like to use any list on my phone because it's super simple and in the grocery store, I just click on when I you know, picked up the item and they disappear. And then if anyone else in my family wants something from the grocery store, that's health promoting, of course, um, they add it to the grocery list. If it's health hindering, of course, I'll just delete it without getting it. <laughs> but you all can add to this. We can all add to this list. So this is any list and this is the free version. They have you know, one that you can pay for and you have more features, but this works perfectly well and, you know, between my husband and my two boys, if somebody uses up the last bit of almond milk or, um, you know, finishes the mushrooms, they just add it to the grocery list. And I know that I need them again uh, the next time I go. So you've got to create your weekly menu, then create your grocery list, then shop. So go to the grocery store, get everything that's on that grocery list or call this woman. I think she's with Instacart and have her pick up all your groceries and then go. Um, and, and get them. So menu, grocery list, shop, prep. If you need to prep any foods for the week, you can chop up a lot of vegetables and they'll last Monday through Friday if you want to be able to make a salad real quick when you get home one evening. Um, or if you want to make the overnight oats, you can prep those and have those uh, five days worth all done on a Sunday. You can do batch cooking where you you know, just put together, I think this was um, rice and corn 
and tomatoes and lentils and just take that to work with you with the dressing and you have that for lunch. But so we need to, to do our prep work and then we can eat. So weekly menu, grocery list, shop, prep, eat. And if we just think about the steps, write them down if you need to and get it done, make it a priority. And it's really not that hard um, once you get used to it, but you have to get into a routine just like with anything else. And then we can celebrate. So I wanna just show you the power plate because I've talked about these four food groups, fruits, vegetables, grains, and legumes. We wanna make sure that we get all four of these um, into our meals throughout the day. Um, the my plate from the US government has fruits, grains, vegetables, and protein. But I'll point out to you that protein is a macronutrient. It's not a food group. Vegetables, grains, and fruits all have protein in them. So we should think of that fourth group as legumes, beans, peas, and lentils. Those are common to the blue zones. Those are very important parts of their diet. So it's important that we, we put those health promoting foods um, into our daily schedule. So black beans are probably the most common legume that people eat. Chickpeas would be another one. Um, people are usually less familiar with lentils, but once you get familiar with lentils, they're so super easy and they're really quick to cook and they're not nearly as um, cumbersome as beans um, because you don't have to soak them, you don't have to um, cook them for as long. Um, so now we're on to our Q&A. Okay. Well, I have a question. Okay. Um, so what are some good ways that you could introduce healthy options to kids that might be hooked on junk food? Just asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is probably one of the most common questions that I get. I think one of the easiest things to do starts at dinner time where you make a buffet and they choose what to put in. So you provide a lot of healthy options. They don't have to eat all of them, but they're gonna eat some of them. And so kids typically enjoy pasta. So a pasta bar is an easy way to get this process started. So you would have on the kitchen counter, you would make pasta. Then you would have, you know, maybe some spinach that you chopped up real fine really fine because um, you don't want big leafy greens in your in your dinner chop up real fine um, cherry tomatoes olives um, peppers zucchini and you say okay well take your pasta and then just you know pick at least one other thing start with one other thing okay and then hopefully you know they like marinara sauce if they don't that could be something that you're trying to add in butter and cheese um, <laughs> so maybe keep the butter for now and try to, you know, have less cheese okay. and then eventually pull the cheese out. Um, there is a vegan Parmesan that I make that's four ingredients. It's very simple. Um, it's made with cashews, nutritional yeast, garlic powder, and salt. Um, and I'm happy to share that all of these are on uh, my website and you can easily Google what is the website again? So it's plantsoveranimals.com. Um, and the cashew parm typically is a huge hit. I have never heard anybody say they didn't like cashew parm. Um, and that's a great way to get dairy out of the diet. And one reason that I think it's really important to get dairy out of the diet is because when we consume um, anything that's made from the milk of a lactating cow, we are consuming her estrogen. And we know that that estrogen increases the risk of breast cancer, cervical cancer, ovarian cancer, prostate cancer, and testicular cancer. That has been shown um, that people who take dairy out of their diet um, reduce their risk of all reproductive cancers. Yeah, so and that's in addition to saturated fat and cholesterol that is um, abundant in dairy foods as well. Yeah. So, oh, so that bar idea, you can take that then and make, usually the next thing I recommend is a taco bar. So mm -hmm. kids tend to love tacos or burritos. Yeah. Um, and then you can go with corn, beans, you know, salsa, and then the onions and the peppers and all that kind of stuff. 
And so again, they're choosing. When you give kids a choice, it's so much different than saying, eat this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And start small. Pick one of these veggies. Oh my gosh, you've been doing so well. You want to try two veggies now? You know? Right. And usually um, they're pretty receptive to that. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. So um, as far as the standard American diet, can you just enlighten us on how that's kind of shifted or changed over, I, I don't know how many years, maybe the last 50 years? I mean, is it? Oh, definitely. So over the past yeah. 50 years. So in the early 1900s, um, you know, there really weren't processed foods. There weren't bags of chips and Cheetos and all those things that we see in vending machines. Um, that along with cheese, cheese is considered a processed food. People weren't um, eating cheese sticks all the time like they are now. We didn't have like all those packaged cheeses where the sliced cheeses that people use now. The um, cheese consumption increased from three pounds per person per year in 1905 to um, over 30 pounds per person per year now. Um, cheese has more salt um, per serving than potato chips. It's so processed that they have to put cheese, I mean, they put salt in cheese to keep it from spoiling, right? So, um, so cheese is a highly processed food and all those other processed foods, they just weren't around. And if you think about even when, um, so I'm almost 50 and growing up, there weren't Paneras on every corner. There, you know, weren't places where you could stop and, you know, get food anywhere, at any time, any food, which is how it is nowadays. And mega sized. Yes, yes. So that shift from, you know, 50 to 70 to 100 years ago to now is tremendous. Absolutely tremendous. Do you see that changing with the, you know, I don't want to say a vegan movement, but more people that are shifting towards those healthier lifestyles, do you see that sad diet shifting or changing in the next I certainly years? hope so. Mm -hmm. Like we haven't seen any start to the shift yet. I think our biggest risk right now is processed vegan food. So, so there is vegan junk food, right? So anything that's not made from an animal is considered vegan. So Twizzlers are vegan. Chips, you know, chips are vegan, right? So all of these Impossible Burgers, these uh, Beyond Burgers, where they're trying to mimic meat, these are companies who are just trying to retain their market share. Like Burger King, I saw uh, the, through the football game on Sunday, there was a commercial for their beefless burger. Impossible like, Whopper, I think they call it. What? Yes, which is great for the environment. This is great sure. for the environment and for the animals. Sure. Um, not as good for human health. Mm -hmm. So it might not be as bad for human health as a beef burger, but I don't think we really know yet. You know, these things are just coming on the market. We know that they're high in fat. It's not the saturated fat that comes from animal flesh, but, um, but it is fat. And we know that our bodies don't want that much fat. Um, it's just not good for us from the inflammation standpoint, from the lining of our arteries, don't tolerate it well. Um, so we, we need to be careful that we don't substitute um, when we take health hindering foods out of our diet and just assume as long as it's not from an animal that we can eat it. If it's just another processed food, it's probably going to be health hindering also. And I think just the last question is, so, you know, people listening, let's say they start making these changes. Is there a timeline when you start to reap the benefits? Is it different for everybody? Is there a point where you're like, oh, I feel great now. Like, is there a, a so, general timeline guideline to when you start feeling the effects of eating better? So it's going to vary based on your starting point mm -hmm. and based on, um, any health histories that you have. So if you've got heart disease, if you've got diabetes, um, but generally I would say, I would say the great news is people typically start to feel better within a number of weeks. It's wow. usually pretty drastic. Um, now it depends on how much change you make, how quickly. Mm -hmm. 
if you're someone who needs to start with breakfast to get that well oiled and then move on, it's going to take longer. But hang in there because it will get better and you'll feel so much better. Um, but I have a client who back in March, in March, um, had a couple stents placed for heart disease. So he found out that he had um, a 70% blockage in his um, left anterior descending artery in his heart, which is called the widow maker. Uh, because if that one um, doesn't get enough, if you don't get enough oxygen through the blood supply to that part of your heart, um, you can die instantly. So um, he luckily didn't um, and contacted me and said, hey, I'd like to try to reverse my disease with a plant-based diet. And within three months, made such remarkable changes, came off his blood pressure medicine, came off his Lipitor, um, has to stay on um, three blood thinners right now for the year because he has a stent in place, but got rid of um, the other medications that he was on just by going to a plant-based diet. And does he enjoy the diet? I mean, that's amazing in and of itself, but is he, is he enjoying it? Is it something he that he loves it. excited about? Absolutely loves it because he feels so good. Mm -hmm. He feels so good. And knowing that he has control over what happens to him is huge. He's huge. Like he at first felt like he was a victim, like, oh my God, I can't believe this happened to me. But once he realized that he could control his future from here on out, um, it was extremely empowering. And um, the difference has been just huge. And I'm so excited for him that, yeah, it's great. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we have any other questions for today. So okay. Thank you again for being with us. We love when you're here. You have such great insight into, you know, staying healthy or getting healthy. Um, if any of you out there listening um, have a need for Brooke to come out to your organization and, um, you know, help with, with anything there, we can tailor any of her information. Bring bananas. <laughs> <laughs> we can tailor anything towards your organization. Um, Give us, you know, contact us at info at advantage-c.com or give us a call, seven, or, I'm sorry, 410, I was giving my cell phone number there, 410-386-8095. <laughs> Again, thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next month. We don't have a topic at this point, uh, but as soon as we do, we will go ahead and show that out through um, our marketing. So have a great day, everyone, and thanks again.